This Is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Dolores Huerta devoted her life to the labor movement and was committed to protecting the rights of Chicanos and other minorities. Her efforts alongside activist Cesar Chavez led to the creation of the first union for farm workers. Yet Dolores Huerta is not a household name. A new documentary explains why. The film is called Dolores and it premieres in U.S. theaters this September, including here in Connecticut. Ms. Huerta will join us later in the show to talk about her life, and we'll ask her what she thinks about the activist movement today. Coming up, we'll also speak to a former naval officer about the frequency of collisions in the U.S. Navy. The last crash claimed the lives of 10 sailors, including a young man from Suffield, Connecticut. The Hudson Institute's Seth Cropsey will join us and share why he believes the string of accidents points to the Navy being overstretched. But first, we turn our attention to the Gulf Coast. Harvey is now a tropical depression, having dumped rain on Louisiana and is moving further east. But Houston, Texas is still recovering from the storm aftermath when it was a hurricane nearly a week ago. Now, when disasters happen, Americans feel compelled to help. Who should you trust with your donations? Join the conversation, 860-275-7266. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook at Where We Live. In Connecticut, residents and businesses have pledged their support of Houston area residents. To tell us more, we're joined on the phone by Russell Blair. He's a reporter for the Hartford Current. Russell, welcome, welcome to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Thanks for having me. Tell, tell us about how residents uh, in our local communities are trying to help these victims of the this, this Storm Harvey. Um, well, there's a lot of groups that are doing a lot of great work uh, down there. Obviously, you have you know the big groups like uh, the American Red Cross, which has a chapter in Connecticut and Rhode Island. They've sent more than 50 people down there. But there's also some uh, groups that are headquartered right here in the state. Uh, we have AmeriCares in Stanford, and, and their specialty is uh, delivering medicine to shelters and to people to evacuees and people that are escaping uh, from Harvey. And then we also have Save the Children, which is headquartered in Fairfield. Uh, and their priority is getting down to these shelters and finding ways to help out uh, some of the children that have had to uh, escape from Harvey down there. And, and oftentimes these shelters, maybe they have the necessities that you need, food and beds, but they might not have the medicine or they might not have the types of uh, things that children will need. Uh, and it looks like it's going to be an extended stay for many of these families. Just, you know, you watch the reports and see the devastation down there. Uh, they could be in these shelters for a while. Now, with the reporting that you and your colleagues have done at The Current, uh, do Connecticut residents, do they know where to turn uh, to either uh, send their donations? I know oftentimes people want to send actual uh, material goods like uh, clothes or, or water. I mean, wh- where do people turn when they want to find uh, where to send the, this kind of contribution? Uh, the governor's office actually put out some guidance on this, uh, I think, on Monday, and said the best thing that people can do is really to contribute money to these big organizations that have the uh, logistical support, they have the know-how to do it. Um, some of the groups I mentioned, uh, you know, the American Red Cross, uh, AmeriCares, uh, Save the Children, you know, these are groups that have responded to disasters before. Uh, they know what to do. So when money goes to these groups, uh, you know, it can be used rather quickly. One of the things that uh, was noted in some of that guidance that came from both uh, the governor's office and, and Department of Consumer Protection was that uh, there can be people that are well-meaning and, and want to help, uh, but if they don't have the know-how, if they don't have the support, um, and you, you give money to some of these smaller upstart organizations, uh, they may have a tougher time actually using that money uh, to help the victims. It may take longer for that help to arrive. You mentioned Governor Malloy. Uh, tell us how the Connecticut National Guard is assisting with uh, relief and recovery efforts down in the Gulf Coast. Uh, so the National Guard sent down a plane uh, and eight airmen uh, and their mission down there in Texas was they went to Austin and they helped to uh, coordinate uh, delivery of some of the different materials that were coming in. They were down there for a couple days. Uh, and yesterday the, the guard said that the airmen had returned back to Connecticut, but they're ready if they have to go down for uh, an additional mission. But their priority down there was, was helping to distribute a lot of this material that's coming in. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. First up today on the show, we're talking about Harvey. First a hurricane, now a tropical depression uh, battering the Gulf Coast. We're hearing from Russell Blair from the Hartford Current about some of the ways Connecticut residents are trying to help those affected by Harvey. Now, when disasters happen, how do you know your donations, your efforts will, will make it to the people who need it most? To help us answer that question, we're joined now by Juanita Rilling, Senior Humanitarian Advisor for McFadden Associates. She's also former director of USAID's Center for International Disaster disaster information. Juanita, welcome to the show. Good morning, Lucy. It's delightful to be here. Uh, We hear often people want to send monetary donations. What are some of the common mistakes that people make when they hear about these disasters? And of course, they want to help. 
Well, I'd, I'd like to start by talking about the best thing you can do, um, because you don't have to travel to Texas to save lives. You can save lives from your living room, and actually you can save more lives from your living room than you can if you travel down there if you're just like you and me. So the, the very best way to help people in Houston, as Russell said, is do cash donations to relief and charitable organizations working on the ground. And there, this is widely known, but there are three really important reasons why this is true. The first is that disaster situations evolve very quickly, and cash donations enable relief organizations to meet needs as they change. So a single individual today may need search and rescue help, followed by emergency medical help, followed by shelter, followed by nutritional help. And cash donations enable all of those things to happen for hundreds of people. The second thing is that cash donations allow relief organizations to purchase supplies locally. And even in the worst disaster, and Harvey qualifies, there is a healthy perimeter of markets from which supplies can be purchased. And those local purchases enable, um, or they, uh, they enable um, relief organizations to give supplies that are fresh and familiar to survivors. They're purchased in just the right quantities, exact quantities, and they entail very low transportation costs, so they're delivered quickly. And those local purchases are super important because they strengthen local economies for the long recovery period because, you know, disaster is not, it doesn't just affect people and infrastructure, it affects the whole community and the economy. So cash donations are the simplest for donors, and they also give the best help to survivors, relief organizations, and local economies. They are a quadruple win, just so much winning. Now, Juanita, you mentioned that there are ways where um, people can make sure that when they're donating, that it's going to the local communities and buying um, the necessities that are needed. Where do they go to get that information? Um, uh, the, the best way to look for information is through the charity watchdogs. So there's charitynavigator.org and givewell.org and charitywatch.org and the Better Business Bureau's Wise Giving Alliance where you can look up any charity online and just vet them for financial and programmatic integrity. You can see what kinds of work they do. You can see how they spend their money. And if you're, if you're interested in a charity with which you're not familiar, if it doesn't appear on those websites, then, you know, buyer beware, because you don't really know where your money's going unless you can vet the organization. And these online watchdogs are the best way to do that. Now, we, we're familiar with the big charity organizations like American Red Cross. I'm sure you've um, heard and, and read the reporting that NPR and ProPublica have done about um, charities of this size, um, Red Cross, misstating how donor do dollars are spent, um, a portion of the money even for the earthquake relief in Haiti in 2010, much of it being, a lot of it, a big chunk being spent for internal uh, expenses. Does that, uh, you know, cause people to not trust uh, these big names when they want to try to help? Um, it certainly does. But for every sort of scandal or suspected scandal uh, in an organization, there are dozens of charities that are fiscally responsible, that do compelling work that people care about, and that are worthy of donations. And some of the smaller organizations can be found on globalgiving.org which funds tiny NGOs all over the world who do great work. And the, um, the local organizations in Houston that are, um, there's a great article on Texas, in the most recent Texas Monthly that lists a, f a few community and local organizations very worthy of support. And really, just personally, I like giving to local organizations because they understand and know the needs of the local population. This is where we live. We're also hearing from you know local businesses about how they want to help. I, I want to bring into the conversation uh, a call now. Uh, Joe's calling from Hartford. Joe, I understand you're the owner of uh, the Hartford Hanging Hills Brewery. Yes, thank you for having me on the show. So tell us how you guys are trying to help uh, the Harvey victims. Uh, well, uh, the, it kind of goes back to 2005. Um, I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time, and uh, Katrina had just come through and decimated New Orleans. And um, I saw all those pictures and the video feeds of the people stranded on rooftops. And, uh, you know, I was broke. I was 25. Couldn't get down to help. I couldn't actually send money because I didn't have any to spend. And I just felt so helpless and distraught with all these people just kind of screwed over that uh, when we opened up our brewery, I wanted to turn it into you know, obviously it's a small business, but we also wanted to be able to turn it into something that is part of a collective humanity. And um, 
this seemed like the perfect opportunity. Um, and Friday, this coming Friday, we are donating 100% of our tasting room sales uh, to uh, uh, relief organizations that are going in to help out in uh, Houston right now. Well, Joe, it sounds like a, a great idea. Again, uh, he's the owner of Hanging Hills Brewery. Uh, thank you for so much for giving us a call and let us know how you want to try to help uh, the victims of Harvey. I wanted to go back to Hartford Current reporter uh, Russell Blair. Um, other businesses locally, Russell, that you're hearing that are trying to help? Yeah, one uh, business we talked to is uh, Bull Bag. It's a dumpster company in Killingworth. And the owner there actually responded and brought dumpsters to Katrina to help with the cleanup there. And he's pledged again that he's going to be sending uh, seven trucks down to Texas to help with uh, the cleanup there once uh, the water subsides. So, you know, this is going to be, I think, a massive recovery effort, uh, massive cleanup, massive rebuilding. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of need for donations, supplies, uh, all kinds of support, you know, beyond uh, just where we are now with, with these shelters, uh, there's also going to have to be the rebuilding, housing, construction, cleanup, uh, all these types of things. Um, another company in Connecticut, uh, uh, Nestle Water, is sending down millions of bottles of water. Um, so, you know, there's, there's big corporations in Connecticut and small corporations, too, uh, that are doing their part um, to, to help out with all this. Uh, you, you raise an interesting point, uh, Russell, about uh, the, the recovery takes years. And Juanita, I wanted to go back to you again, uh, Juanita Rilling, Senior Humanitarian Advisor for McFadden Associates. Uh, it's, so, it's so common where we see, we're seeing these like heartbreaking images. It's in the news each day. People want to help now, but it's easy to forget this region uh, months from now. Uh, that is true. And it's important in big disasters like this and Katrina as well. Um, that we pace ourselves. Um, yes, it's, it's good to give now, and it will be good to sort of pick a charity and fall in love with the charity and support the charity at least once a month for the duration is what some people like to do, and that's helpful. Other lessons we can learn from uh, the, the reaction to Hurricane Katrina, Juanita? Um, well, let's talk about material donations, which are very tricky. Um, and I'm giving you an insider view as someone who's had to deal with this issue um, as a disaster responder. So it is, it is known that cash donations are the most effective, but some people feel that cash donations, cash donations are impersonal or they just, for whatever reason, don't want to give cash. So they start collecting used clothing and canned food and bottled water and other household items to ship them or drive them to the disaster affected area. But this is so very important that unless a material donation is specifically requested by a responding organization that will receive it and manage it and distribute it, it will likely actually have very negative impacts on survivors and on the relief effort. So we saw this after Hurricane Sandy when truckloads of used clothing that no one had asked for and household items filled up you know, churches and schools and warehouses that could have been used for shelters or to distribute more urgently needed items. And the worst case um, for this was after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti when Port-au-Prince literally filled up with unrequested low-priority donations so that emergency personnel and supplies had to be transported to the Dominican Republic and trucked to Haiti at tremendous additional expense to responding organizations. Mm. So these donations can actually be harmful. And if if it's okay, I'll, I can tell you three ways in which to sort of emphasize the point and to, you know, encourage people to send cash. The, the, the three ways are that if you think about it, in communities all over the United States, people are collecting, say, use, use clothing, canned food, and bottled water are the, the three big ones. And these donations converge on damaged ports and airports and parking lots at the same time that needed emergency supplies arrive. So we'll have used clothing competing for flat, dry space with search and rescue personnel and equipment, emergency medical supplies, plastic sheeting and jerry cans, and other needed items. And so the lower priority donations have to be moved out of the way so that emergency supplies can be distributed and managed. And moving metric tons of household goods takes heavy equipment and gasoline and time and attention away from the relief effort. So the diversion of these critical resources is a sort of a, it's sort of a theft from helping survivors. And that is why even a $1 cash donation does more good than a truck full of unrequested material donations because the latter actually costs money to manage. 
And that's Juanita Rilling, again, a senior humanitarian advisor for McFadden Associates. She's also former director of USAID Center for International Disaster Information. We just have a couple of minutes left. Again, our attention uh, in um, this country, of course, is on the devastation in the Gulf Coast. Uh, right now, um, monsoons in India are causing widespread flooding. Uh, when we see international disaster strike as well, Juanita, you mentioned some places where uh, Americans can go to make sure their dollars are spent wisely. Does this also work for um, international efforts. Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, all of these principles are the same. Cash donations to responding organizations are always best, and material donations have to be sent with tremendous caution and only at the request of a responding organization. For information about international disasters, um, the Center for International Disaster Information, CIDI.org, usually has um, each disaster listed in a, in a how you can help section, so that's a great reference. And I also wanted to mention, um, if you go to our Twitter, we're going to send out a, a link at where we live. Uh, the Hartford Marathon Foundation is holding a virtual 5K to help those affected by Hurricane Harvey uh, run Hartford for Houston. We're going to have information again at our uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts at where we live. I want to thank uh, Juanita Rilling again for joining us and giving us some important tips. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you. Also, Russell Blair, reporter for the Hartford Current. Russell, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, more than one week ago, a U.S. Navy destroyer collided with a tanker ship off the coast of Malaysia. It's the fourth collision of a U.S. Navy ship this year, the second with fatalities, including Connecticut sailor Dustin Doyen. After the break, we speak to a former naval officer about what he believes needs to change to avoid another incident. You can join the conversation too, 860-275-7266. Email where we live at WMPR.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Funeral arrangements for 26-year-old Dustin Doyen, an electronics technician with the U.S. Navy, have yet to be announced. Doyen, a Suffield, Connecticut native, and nine other sailors were aboard the guided missile destroyer USS John S. McCain when it collided with a tanker ship off the coast of Malaysia August 21st. Now, this accident was the third in the U.S. 7th Fleet based in Japan. In June, seven sailors, including another Connecticut sailor, died when the USS Fitzgerald collided with the container ship. The frequency of incidents led the Chief of Naval Operations to relieve the commander of the 7th Fleet from duty. Now, have you served in the U.S. Navy? Do you have a family member currently enlisted? What's your reaction to these incidents? Do you believe this boils down to a training issue, a command issue, or something else? Join the conversation, 860-275-7266. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. We wanted to speak to an expert on this. So joining us now by phone is Seth Cropsey, director of the Hudson Institute's Center for American Sea Power. He served as a naval officer and a deputy under Undersecretary of the Navy in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. Also the author of a new book, Sea Blindness, How Political Neglect is Choking American Sea Power and What to Do About It. Seth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. So tell us first about this area uh, where the USS John S. McCain was when that collision occurred August 21st, Seth. Well, the area is very congested. Uh, It's... uh, East of Singapore, which is one of the largest uh, merchant shipping harbors in the world, um, I think it's probably the largest in terms of container container shipping, and it's also just uh, abutting the uh, the Malacca Straits, which is one of the choke points uh, that ships going from the Middle East to Asia have to pass through in order to uh, to make the transit. So it's a very crowded area, very heavily used, uh, full of merchant ships, um, and it's a place where you have to be very careful. Now, uh, when this uh, collision happened August 21st, uh, just uh, a couple of months after the U.S. F- Fitzgerald uh, also colliding with, uh, I think, a, a tanker ship, I mean, what was your reaction, Seth, when you heard this? Well, I was uh, very saddened by the loss of life. Um, it's terrible. Uh, and the natural questions occurred. These are, these are two incidents of four that have taken place since, uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, they, in January, the 
a ship called the Antietam uh, dragged its anchor um, uh, in the um, in Japan, uh, and then that led to a, a running aground in a high tide and, and strong winds, and that shouldn't happen. Um, and then in May, there was another incident, which has not been included in this. There was no loss of life, fortunately, uh, but uh, a cruiser of the Lake Champlain collided with a South Korean fishing vessel uh, east of the Korean Peninsula. So it's not just these two. And uh, that raises questions about seamanship and training and readiness. And all of those questions are under an investigation um, as both the investigation into the Fitzgerald and the McCain collisions proceed. Uh, is there an over-reliance on technology uh, for these sailors uh, when they're when they're traver- traversing through these, you know, again, the world's busiest uh, shipping lane off the Straits of Malacca? Well, I think that's what the investigation, uh, that's one of the things that the investigation is certainly going to look at. Uh, but the Chief of Naval Operations, Adam Richardson, when he asked for the and directed the investigations, uh, mentioned several things, and training was one of them. Uh, so I expect that will get a good uh, that, will, that will be scrutinized very carefully. Now, when we look at uh, the U.S. Navy fleet over the last few decades, what has been happening there? Well, I think that's uh, I think that's the the large issue here, and the the one that really needs to be addressed because it's possible to figure out what was going on on the bridge of a particular ship at a, at a certain moment, and it, to res- assign responsibility both for the commanding officer of the ship and the crew and and uh, uh, the commander of the, of the fleet. Uh, but the large question is um, uh, what's happening to the Navy? And that's a different question, or it's, it, it, it's the same question but it asked in a different form. And that is that the Navy is being has been since uh, a few years after the Cold War ended um, has been asked to do more and more, and the fleet size has shrunk from nearly 600 ships at the end of the Cold War to the current level of 276. So, uh, as events like the rise of Chinese naval power in the West Pacific, um, the increasing threats in the Arabian Gulf, uh, Afghanistan, uh, ISIS, the larger increased presence of uh, Russian ships in the Black Sea and in the Baltic Seas. All these developments have occurred over the past 10 or 15 years, and that's uh, required more naval U.S. naval presence at the same time that the size of the U.S. fleet is decreasing. This is where we live. On the phone with us is Seth Cropsey. Again, he's director of the Hudson Institute Center for American Sea Power, also a former naval officer, deputy undersecretary of the Navy in the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. We're speaking with Seth today uh, as we uh, look at why there have been four incidents, uh, collisions and other uh, incidents uh, within the U.S. Navy in the last year. Uh, Seth, uh, you wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, titled, Has the Navy Reached Its Breaking Point? Part of that being uh, the size of the fleet shrinking, as you said, since uh, the end of the Cold War. What about deployments? Are sailors spending more time on the seas? Could that be adding to fatigue and stress? Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, as, uh, as the requirements, the demand for ships has increased and the fleet has decreased. Uh, one of the ways the Navy has tried to answer the, the requirement is to keep ships at sea longer and it's like your car Um, if you go uh, if you drive it longer and longer without um, without maintenance uh, when you finally come in to uh, (laughs) get the car fixed 
uh, it's going to cost more and it's going to take longer to repair. And it's, you multiply that by several orders of magnitude and um, you have what the Navy is facing. More deployments, um, longer deployments, more maintenance, and that, um, that makes it difficult to do other things like training. So uh, it's, it's a large problem. It's not isolated to the Seventh Fleet not isolated to the West Pacific. It's a problem that the Navy faces glo- globally, worldwide. Now, we mentioned that three of these incidents happened um, in the seventh fleet of the U.S. Navy. Uh, you talked about uh, uh, disputes in the South China Sea and also dealing with North Korea. Um, how um, detrimental is this that you're having this fleet having these issues in that part of the world? Well, it's very detrimental. Um, the Two ships that have been taken out of service as a result of collisions, um, unfortunately, uh, are ballistic missile ha- are equipped with ballistic missile defenses, and so that's two fewer ships when there aren't that many ships in the first place uh, that are that are equipped to uh, shoot down missiles that might be aimed either at uh, at our allies or at us. So that's serious business. You've also uh, written that it's not just about making the fleet larger uh, as we look at um, some of the gains being made, especially uh, in the Chinese Navy. Can you talk a little bit about, I know we, we know that the Trump administration has uh, proposed a $54 billion increase in defense spending, but it's not just about, about building more ships? Well, uh, the the proposal to increase the defense spending that you just mentioned uh, is going to um, will be used to address a lot of the maintenance and inventory problems that the military has experienced over the past uh, 8, 10, 12 years that have been growing during that time. It's not going to um, do a great deal. It's not going to do anything to increase the size of the fleet. Uh, If the administration is going to make good on its pledge to increase the fleet, um, it's going to require considerably larger resources than the $54 billion. And by the way, that $54 billion is slightly more, but very, you know, a, a, a fraction of a percentage more than what the Obama administration had proposed and um, what would have been in place if uh, Trump's opponent had won and decided to accept the recommendations of her predecessor. So it's important, it's necessary, it's needed, it will be helpful, uh, but that's going to go toward solving large problems that have accumulated over the years and um, it's not enough to it's not enough to make a dent in the shipbuilding problem. Now, if you're a former uh, Navy service member or you have a family member enlisted in the Navy, we want to hear from you too. Eight six zero two seven five seven two six six. Seth, we're getting a tweet from a listener, Scott. Uh, he writes, "There has been a major collapse of basic naval seamanship, and it starts from the top." Uh, he served on the USS George Washington from 1990 to 1996. He writes, "The bridge is intense." Your reaction? Yeah, I, there's. Uh, something that's clearly wrong. Um, The preliminary investigation into the Fitzgerald accident found that the the, uh, bridge crew uh, watch was uh, lacked, uh, had insufficient situational awareness, and that's sort of Navy speak for they weren't aware of what was going on around them. Um, or they weren't sufficiently aware, thus the collision. So uh, seamanship is definitely a factor in this, and that's why uh, I I think it's a good thing that the Chief of Naval Operations has directed the training be looked at very carefully. And the U.S. had Fitzgerald, the command was relieved after that investigation? That's correct, yeah. Uh, also, the Seventh Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Joseph Ockhoin, was dismissed. Um, how long relieved. will this uh, relieved? And what yeah. that means his career is over? 
Uh, he was set to retire a month in a month, um, but even if it hadn't, um, the chances of his uh, of his getting a fourth star would have been non-existent. Mm. Now, uh, with this investigation of the USS uh, McCain uh, collision, how long will that take? And what, as from your experience and your expertise, again, serving in the Navy, also um, from your position at the Hudson Institute, what would you like to see happen? Well, um, the most important thing that I'd like to see happen is that the shipbuilding budget of the Navy be increased uh, so that more ships could be built um, and that would relieve the pressure uh, that is ultimately responsible for um, for these accidents. Um, in the short term, uh, I think that uh, a very careful look at uh, seamanship training, um, how officers are screened for major commands, uh, how they're trained. Um, in the courses that they receive before they go to command uh, a surface ship uh, or a submarine, but those are all important things. But ultimately, this is not, this problem is not going away unless uh, the United States reduces its its commitments or else increases the size of its fleet. Uh, we know that America has been long seen as a superpower. A part of that is through maritime supremacy. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, strategy uh, within the U.S. Navy um, in the coming years. Well, uh, that's something that needs to be looked at also at the, uh, looked at the, at the same time. Um, one of the most important things is that, as I mentioned, that uh, the demand for uh, for our naval presence has increased, and we're hard pressed to supply that demand. So I, I think that the first most important thing is the objective is to make sure that we have an effective combat presence continual combat presence um, in three places, in the Arabian Gulf, uh, in the West Pacific, and in the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean is a big problem because where the United States used to have two aircraft carriers and uh, two marine amphibious units, sizable ones, um, in the Mediterranean, we don't anymore. Um, the ships that are there are either assigned temporarily there or else are passing uh, the Mediterranean, transiting the Mediterranean uh, to the Arabian Gulf or back from the Arabian Gulf. Otherwise, the Sixth Fleet, the Mediterranean Fleet, consists of four ballistic missile defense destroyers and a command ship, and that's it. Mm. So I think that we need to relook at um, the threat, uh, the problems that we're likely to face in the future, uh, the increased presence of the Russian fleet in the Eastern Mediterranean, and I think that we need to be able, we need to, be able to provide a, a greater uh, U.S. combat presence uh, in the form of ships uh, in the Mediterranean as well as in the West Pacific and the Arabian Gulf. And that doesn't begin to address the, the growing problems of uh, Russian naval presence in the Black Sea and in the Baltic. Now, uh, when we were talking about the South China Sea a little bit earlier, Seth, uh, explain to our listeners again uh, why there is the dispute there and what's happening right now. Well, the dispute is longstanding, and it's between uh, China which claims um, a large part of the international waters um, of the South China Sea as uh, a sovereign territory, as, ter as territorial waters. Uh, and China has um, tried to lay, lay claim to 
uh, islands there and build islands in order to establish um, its its uh, its claims of sovereignty. And a lot of those and, and these islands are some of them are hundreds of miles distant from China, and the countries uh, that border the South China Sea, like the Philippines and Vietnam, for example. Um, don't agree, uh, and so there's been a a dispute over sovereignty in the South China Sea, extending far beyond the limits that China agreed to as a member of the Law of the Sea uh, Convention. And this goes back years, and China has been increasing its navy. Uh, in order to lay claim to those islands. It's been building the islands up. It's been arming the islands. Uh, and so that's a, a very contentious issue, and um, it's likely to become more contentious in the future. And also earlier you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, your wish list uh, would be to see the fleet expanding. There's definitely a portion of Americans who don't want to see billions of dollars of taxpayer money to uh, to contribute uh, to um, the business of defense contractors and the whole military industrial complex. How do you respond to that, Seth? Well, it, the the end result here is not uh, defense contractors. It's the security of the United States. And I understand that people... Um, have other priorities, but the first responsibility of the president of the federal government is to protect the security of the United States. And uh, our commerce um, depends upon uh, our, our financial prospects in a globalizing world depend upon being able to use the seas to transport our goods and to receive goods from other countries from all over the world. And the Navy protects that. So uh, if there are people, if there are those who want to uh, decrease defense spending, um, I understand that, but there are consequences, and the consequences are to our safety and to our, uh, our, our commerce, our economy. On the flip side, uh, Seth, before we head to break, you know, I've seen reports of, of leaders in the Pentagon uh, actually chastising the uh, Congress for authorizing things that they really don't need. Uh, unfortunately, this goes back <laughs> a long, long time. Um, that's a, a problem that uh, has uh, is not a partisan issue. It's a question of members from particular districts wanting uh, business thrown in their direction, and uh, that doesn't always suit the country's needs. Um, but this is a democratic political system, and uh, Congress writes the bills. So if Congress says it wants to spend on something or other, you know, it's two choices. You either do it or the president vetoes it. And um, that, does, that doesn't happen very much. I just want to read one more tweet from a listener. Uh, Doug writes, the surface Navy needs to look hard at its culture, such as crew rest and standardized training as uh, with Naval Air. So uh, that's also from Doug, another listener. I want to thank Seth Cropsey, director of the Hudson Institute Center for American Sea Power. Again, we were talking about uh, why there have been uh, four incidents within the U.S. Navy in the last year of collisions, two of those uh, collisions causing fatalities, including two sailors who lost their lives. Uh, Seth Cropsey, author of the new book, Sea Blindness, How Political Neglect is Choking American Sea Power and What to Do About It. Seth, thank you for uh, your expertise on this matter. Thank you, Lucy. Now, just ahead, do you know the story of Dolores Huerta? She fought to protect farm workers' rights alongside Cesar Chavez, and they eventually helped create the United Farm Workers of America Union. Starting in September, U.S. theaters, including here in Connecticut, will screen a new documentary about her life. It's called Dolores. We'll speak with Ms. Huerta after the break. This is where we live.
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Tomorrow, Hartford School's newest superintendent, Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez, will be in our studio to answer your questions, also talk about her vision uh, to help uh, the Hartford Public Schools. Again, that's tomorrow on Where We Live. We hope you can join us. Dolores is an icon. She's a civil rights hero. She's the first general that I followed into war. She's not afraid to speak truth to power. Dolores Huerta, who is an old friend of mine. The FBI knew how dangerous Dolores was. Dolores came up with the slogan, Si se puede. Yes, we can. Starting tomorrow, a new documentary focusing on the life of civil rights activist Dolores Huerta will be at theaters around the country. The film's called Dolores. It chronicles the work that she and activist Cesar Chavez, who helped create the National Farm Workers Association, eventually leading to the creation of the United Farm Workers of America Union. We're going to have information on where the film will be shown in Connecticut coming up. First, Dolores Huerta joins us now by phone. Dolores, welcome to the show. Oh, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I understand, again, co-founder of the United Farm Workers of America, also president and founder of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. What are your thoughts on this new documentary all about you, Dolores? Well, I think it's not so much about me as it is about uh, how farm workers who were the poorest of the poor and uh, very discriminated and oppressed were able to overcome uh, their conditions and to organize, uh, to be able to pass legislation to uh, be able to organize into a union and to get uh, toilets in the fields and cold drinking water, rest periods and safety uh, conditions that they they were uh, deprived of before. And I think that's what it's about. It's about how uh, people coming together, no matter how poor you are, uh, if you're not a U.S. citizen, if you're not can't speak the English language if you're very, very poor, that you can really uh, make a change in your life, you know, uh, by coming together and organizing. I think that's the message that we want the film to get out there. But it's definitely still the title, Dolores, and a lot of the efforts uh, were led by you to help these farm workers. How did you get involved in this, Dolores? Well, actually, uh, I had been involved with another organization uh, before uh, the Farm Workers Union called the Community Service Organization, and it was a grassroots organization, and we passed a lot of laws in California, like being able to register voters door-to-door, that you didn't have to go down to the courthouse or, or have a deputy register you to vote. Uh, like, unfortunately, they still have that in Texas, uh, but in California, we were able to change that like 60 years ago. Uh, get unemployment insurance for farm workers, disability insurance for farm workers, uh, ballots uh, so that people could vote in their own language, be it Spanish or uh, Chinese or Tagalog or whatever. And these are all laws that we passed uh, before we started the union. But uh, learning how to organize from this great human being uh, named Fred Ross Sr., who taught Cesar and myself how to do grassroots organizing, uh, both Cesar and I left the community service organization, and then we started the United Farm Workers. How difficult was it being a young Latina uh, doing this kind of work? Well, I think the difficulty uh, was not so much in organizing people, because I think people, when they know that you're sincere and that you have their interests at heart and you're not trying to take advantage of them, they will respond and they will come together, they will organize. I think the biggest problem that we always had was with the racism, uh, uh, you know, the domination of the growers, their refusal to really see the farm workers as equals. I think that, that's the biggest uh, difficulty that we had in organizing. What about the machismo of other uh, uh, men that were within your movement, but maybe uh, felt like they identified better and would listen to Cesar Chavez versus you? Oh, well, actually, with the farm workers, that was not an issue. The farm workers responded very well to my organizing and to my leadership. I think the machismo came uh, more with the other leaders <laughs> of the union, the other men that were in, in leadership. Uh, uh, I think that that was a more difficulty. And, uh, you know, and, and as, as women, as you know, we always have to face uh, uh, this, this kind of sexism that exists in our society. Uh, but uh, in terms of the workers themselves, uh, I actually uh, had a very, very good response. You know, I negotiated the contracts. I was an initial or- an, uh, the initial organizer along with SESA, so I had a lot of respect for the workers themselves. Uh, when we watch the documentary early on, uh, someone uh, mentions that you know, you're not a household name do you, and that often it's easy to write women out of history, the contributions that uh, you and others have contributed uh, to these movements. How do you feel about that? And do you see any change in 2017? Uh, well, I do think we, we, I think we do see a gradual change. We do see that that in the civil rights movement, as we look at the names of the civil rights leaders, often we don't see the women mentioned uh, as often as the men. Like we don't see Coretta Scott King uh, mentioned, and we don't see a lot of the other women 
uh, that were really active, and, that, and I think that's kind of the way it was back then uh, in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, but I think that that is changing now. I think women are being more assertive. Uh, we definitely have more women now in, in public life, in our Congress, and we know that women do make a difference. So we just saw recently with the Affordable Care Act when we had uh, uh, two of our Republican women senators uh, that uh, voted against the, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, which would have deprived millions of people uh, from their health care. So we do see that women make a difference, and I think women are being more assertive. I think we still have a long way to go. You know, we, st- we still haven't, uh, uh, we haven't uh, voted uh, to confirm the Equal Rights Amendment, you know, in our Senate of the United States. We're about number 70 in the world when it comes to women in, in leadership. Uh, but I think that we are, uh, we are making gains, but we definitely have to accelerate that uh, to make sure we get more women in public life. Because we know, as I would love to say, if there are no feminists at the table uh, in these boardrooms, uh, they're going to come to the wrong decisions, you know, so we definitely need more women. And we've talked about that on our show. Uh, this is where we live. On the phone with us, Dolores Huerta, uh, a renowned civil rights activist. Uh, she devoted much of her life uh, to the protections uh, of farm workers and other minorities, along with Cesar Chavez. Uh, she's the subject, as well as the work, uh, in the new documentary, Dolores, premiering uh, around the country, including in Connecticut. And we're going to tweet out uh, more information at where we live, uh, where you can see Dolores uh, in Connecticut. Um, what about when you look back at, at your your life, Dolores. I understand you're 87 years old now. Were there times when you became discouraged, such as when uh, your friend uh, Robert F. Kennedy uh, was assassinated? Oh, well, uh, yeah, and that was a, a tragedy that I think our nation still suffers from today, uh, the loss of Robert Kennedy. But uh, the thing is that we know that we have to go forward. We have to keep working because if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. The work's not going to happen. And I think that's the message that we have also for today, that we want people uh, to get engaged. And this is what I hope that the movie portrays, is that we want people to get engaged at the local level. Again, uh, voting is important. It's really imp- I know it's wonderful that we have all of these young people. Like in Boston, when you had 40,000 people that were uh, demonstrating, you know, uh, to support uh, the people that are, are, are out there fighting against hate and violence, and, and that's wonderful. But, you know, we have to be able to get people to come to the polls also. And we have to get them to vote because otherwise we can't change the policies uh, that we need uh, to have a, a more progressive society. So voting, we just want to say to people, please uh, get out there and vote. That is so important. And with my foundation, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, we continue doing the grassroots organizing in our communities, especially in low-income communities. Uh, we just settled a big lawsuit with our uh, high school district there in Bakersfield, California, because of the suspension, uh, high suspension and expulsion of Latino and African American students in the high school. And so, but uh, and the way that we organized, like Cesar and I did back there when we were starting the Farm Workers Union, is by you know meeting with people in their homes, uh, you know, in, encouraging them to get involved, reminding them that they do have the power, and that they can come together and make the changes that they need because they really have the answers to uh, and the solutions to the problems that they have. Dolores, we just have a couple of minutes left, but I did want to ask you: uh, you and Cesar uh, emphasize nonviolence in your strategy to get uh, protections for uh, farm workers and others in the 70s. Uh, today, we see uh, more violent movements. Uh, what would you say to the young activists who are looking to make change uh, but may not b- agree with the nonviolence strategy that you embraced? Well, we have to kind of remind them that, uh, you know, nonviolence is a very strong uh, uh, force. It's a very strong spiritual force. And if, when you, we engage in violence, we're actually uh, joining, joining uh, those that, uh, that use violence against people of color, uh, against women, against our LGBT community. You know, so uh, we don't want them to go on the other side. We want you to be on the right side. And uh, when we use nonviolence, that definitely is where, that we talk about love. Okay, this is nonviolence is love. That means that we also want uh, to reach the hearts and the minds of those that are against us. And uh, one of the things I I do want to say to all those people that might be getting discouraged, uh, you know, the the poem by Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet, who said, they can cut all the flowers, but they can't hold back the spring. So don't get discouraged. And also it's important that we start educating uh, our children uh, to end the racism, the misogyny, the homophobia that we have in our and society. And Dolores, we'll have to leave it there. It was such a pleasure to speak with you, Dolores Huerta. Uh, she's the subject of a new documentary, Dolores. We just tweeted out information at where we live. Dolores, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. No, thank you very much for including us.